Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the DI 101 webinar series. My name is Jared Evans. I'm the uh, Senior Marketing Manager for Distribution International. If you are new to the DI 101 webinar series, I will tell you it is an incredible resource that we offer to DI customers, partners, and associates. Uh, by partnering with our manufacturers and our industry experts, these webinars deliver informative presentations about industry trends, new technology, new products, and product applications. In order to fully support our customers, Distribution International offers products and solutions from multiple manufacturers and brands in many different product categories. This webinar does not represent an endorsement of one manufacturer or brand over another. We pride ourselves in partnering with manufacturers that deliver products of the highest quality to our customers. We are extremely excited to welcome our strategic manufacturing partner, Owens Corning Foam Glass, for today's webinar presentation. They will be discussing design considerations for chilled water systems. Let me take a second to introduce our presenters. We have Mackenzie Mahalski. Um, two things of note, she goes by Kenzie, and the C in her last name should be ignored. It's Mahalski. So, uh, she is a technical services engineer for the industrial foam glass business at Owen, Owens Corning. She's a graduate from the University of Toledo with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a minor in Professional Sales. Mahalski is a certified energy appraiser through the National Insulation Association and an ASTM committee member as well. We also have Alec Cusick, who is also a technical services engineer for the industrial foam glass business. Prior to his current role, uh, Cusick was in technical sales for fiberglass and mineral wool mechanical insulation with Owens Corning. So he's been on both sides of the, of the business. He serves on multiple technical committees, including ASHRAE and the National Insulation Association. Cusick is an ITC certified level one infrared thermographer. Uh, man, that was a mouthful. And a NIAA, NIA certified insulation energy appraiser. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering also from the University of Toledo. We're proud to have uh, Kinsey and Alec from uh, Owens Corning Foam Glass present today, and we thank them for their time. We will field questions at the end of the webinar. To submit questions, please use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar using that questions tab, and we will answer the questions um, during the question period at, at the end. So without further delay, I'm going to turn this over to Kinsey. Perfect. Thank you, Jared. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us here today. So we're going to start off with our agenda. This is a high level look at what Alec and I are going to be discussing, starting with a little bit about OC, some challenges one may see with chilled water lines, design considerations that need to be taken into account, what is cellular glass insulation? And then finally, some of the technical services that our team offers today. So for those who may not be familiar, Owens Corning is a global industrial and building materials leader with three integrated businesses dedicated to the manufacture and advancement of insulation, roofing, and fiberglass composite materials. We have over 20,000 employees that operate across 33 different countries around the globe. And we are a very proud member of the Fortune 500 company list. Um, and we have been that way consecutively for the past 67 years. Owens Corning offers a wide variety of different insulation products that can be used in many different areas in modern commercial facilities. Our products include both open and closed cell insulation solutions, including cellular glass, fiberglass, mineral wool, and extruded polystyrene. So now we're going to move right on into our main topic for today, which is going to focus on some of the challenges you may face when designing chilled water systems. So commercial projects such as airports, convention centers, and stadiums can have complexities with challenging components and obstacles to design around. Chilled water lines within HVAC commercial cooling systems are no exception, and the insulation systems that are installed on them are a common area where reinstallation after the initial construction may be required due to unanticipated system failures. 
So when we talk about chilled water systems, there's typically going to be a temperature range that we are referring to. This can be down to 36 degrees Fahrenheit for any chilled water supply lines and all the way up to 55 degrees Fahrenheit for your chilled water return lines. If you've ever had a cold beverage outside on a hot summer's day on a patio, you're already familiar with condensation condensation or moisture buildup, which is what we are going to be discussing in further detail throughout this presentation, specifically on the cold surface of piping. So this condensation can bring about a variety of challenges for the insulation system on that cold pipe. We're going to discuss things like strong vapor drive into and onto that cold pipe surface underneath the insulation, the performance of the insulation system's vapor barrier, and when a system is subject to failure, it can bring about a variety of other issues that can either be immediately apparent or remain undetected for months and even years. So here we can see some of the most common examples of those issues, typically found on failed chilled water insulation systems. They include dripping water, causing slip and other safety hazards, mold and mildew form forming, leading to poor indoor air quality, the corrosion of metal pipe and nearby equipment, and then increased operating costs due to the loss of insulation efficiency. So in many cases, the most immediate noticeable symptom of a failed insulation system on a chilled water line can just simply be the presence of dripping water from the system itself. If water vapor is allowed to penetrate through the vapor barrier of the insulation system and condense on the cold pipe surface, it can then build up to the point where it then re-escapes the insulation and drips down below to whatever is underneath it. If that's a floor, then that's obviously going to be a slipping hazard for anyone that's walking nearby. If it's a ceiling tile, then that can cause staining like you see on the bottom right photo of this slide. And if there's any nearby equipment that that water can drip onto, it can then cause corrosion concerns. So another potential consequence for a failed insulation system on a chilled water line is going to involve the growth of mold and mildew, which will form in the presence of any food source and moisture. Most insulation materials don't act as a food source themselves for mold to form. Most of the time that food source is introduced to the system after the fact, and that can be something as simple as dust, skin cells, or any other byproducts of the natural environment. Once moisture is introduced to the system, then you're gonna be at risk for the formation of mold and mildew, posing an immediate concern for indoor air quality for individuals that are nearby. Mold has been linked to many symptoms like chronic fatigue, headaches, asthma attacks, and other lung illnesses. Toxic mold is the focus of a growing number of legal cases across the country, and the design decisions that lead to the formation of mold in commercial buildings is becoming a topic under much more scrutiny in recent years. So another byproduct of introducing moisture under your insulation system involves the potential for corrosion under insulation to occur, or CUI. So some of the key ingredients for corrosion to occur on carbon steel is gonna involve the presence of oxygen and liquid moisture. Oxygen is virtually almost always readily available, whether that be in the air or dissolved in water itself. When condensation takes place and moisture is present, you are going to be at risk for corrosion to begin. So corrosion can damage pipes and remain hidden hidden until it's too late. In the most catastrophic instances, this will result in failure of your entire piping system in general. So one more consequence of excessive condensation taking place within your insulation involves the loss of that insulation's efficiency. If the wrong insulation material is chosen, it can absorb and retain any moisture from that condensation forming. It's widely known in the industry that insulation is much less effective when it's allowed to become saturated with water. 
This then leads to what we call thermal bridging and allows more heat gain back into your chilled water supply lines, which will then lead to energy losses and increased costs requiring more energy to cool the supply piping back down to that 40 degree operating temperature. This can also result in the loss of process control with warmer supply lines and diminishing the cooling effect in the commercial building. And then lastly, this is gonna put unnecessary strain on your equipment and add stress to the chillers in order to reduce the temperature of the chilled water back down to that operating temperature it needs to be at. So now that we've identified some of the most common issues associated with chilled water and insulation failures, let's now discuss some of the key considerations that can be made during the design phase of your system. So I'd like to start off with just covering some key terminology that we're going to be using. First, let's start off with humidity. Humidity is the concentration of water vapor present in any given airspace. Relative humidity is a percentage ratio that compares the actual amount of moisture in the air versus the amounts that it could hold at a given temperature. Moving on, we have vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the pressure at which water, both liquid and vapor, will exist in equilibrium. When the air temperature of a given space is lowered, this equilibrium is going to be disturbed and liquid water will condense as dew until equilibrium is achieved. And then finally, the dew point is the temperature at which condensation will begin and is a product of both temperature and relative humidity. When air cools to its dew point through through contra contact uh, with a surface that is colder than the air, water will condense onto that surface. So you can view vapor pressure similar to that of normal pressure, and that is vapor will always move to areas of high pressure to low pressure, or you can think of it as moving from warm air to cool air. In this case, moving towards the cold surface of a chilled water pipe. An insulation system with a compromised vapor barrier can allow this moisture in the air to move towards that cold pipe where it can then condense into liquid moisture. This insulation system can become compromised due to initial poor insulation or damage that happens after the fact, whether that be from maintenance activities or typical pedestrian traffic within the area. So when determining the right insulation material for your chilled water system, one property you may want to consider is the permeability of that insulation material. So permeability is the tendency a material has to allow liquids or gases to pass through it. Permeable insulations are gonna rely solely on the performance of that external vapor barrier to keep water vapor out of the system. If that vapor barrier becomes compromised, permeable insulations can allow water to move towards the cold pipe where it may condense around the surface. This condensed water can then be absorbed and retained into the insulation, which can compromise your K value, leading to lower external surface temperatures of the insulation itself. And you're essentially gonna end up with a situation where you not only have condensation taking place on the chilled water pipe itself, but potentially on the external facing of the insulation. As you can see on the right, closed cell insulations typically tend to have much lower water vapor permeability values than open cell and granular types of insulations. So as I just mentioned, surface temperature for your insulation is going to play a critical role in the proper condensation control of your system. So proper insulation thickness is necessary to prevent surface condensation or sweating from happening. Our goal should always be to ensure the insulation surface temperature is greater than the surrounding air's dew point. So on this slide, we have an example for you guys. Um, we have a chilled water pipe operating at 40 degrees Fahrenheit with surrounding ambient air at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 75%. This is then going to give us a dew point of 71.3 degrees Fahrenheit. 
In this example specifically, we must have enough insulation thickness to achieve a surface temperature of 74 degrees Fahrenheit, which is going to be greater than the dew point temperature. This will safely prevent surface condensation from occurring on your insulation. I'd like to also point out that even in this scenario, there exists a point within the insulation thickness where the temperature is going to fall below that dew point. However, as long as the system's vapor barrier remains intact, water vapor will not be able to penetrate to the point where it can freely condense. So within the industry, there exists many different standards from different organizations to help aid in the design of commercial insulation systems. One of these standards is ASHRAE 90.1, the energy standard for buildings except low-rise residential buildings. So this standard is going to be commonly referenced in determining thickness requirements for chilled water lines. However, I want you guys to note that this standard is built around energy conservation, not condensation control. So in reality, necessary insulation thickness calculations should be done for each set of conditions unique to your system. And then another piece uh, to consider when designing your chilled water system is going to be the geographic location of your project. So different parts of the country will be subject to different temperatures and relative humidity that's going to result in different vapor pressures. So on this slide, you see a rough illustration of the annual mean maximum dew point temperatures that various parts of the country experience. Condensation becomes a critical concern and a more likely problem to have in high humidity environments where there exists a much higher vapor drive from the ambient air towards a cold pipe surface. I'd also like to point out that this map is the average max dew point, but does not showcase extreme conditions that these locations can experience. So there exists multiple important but less obvious considerations that can often contribute to system failure. For indoor locations, you're gonna to wanna to consider the environment and any additional risk factors that can contribute to increased humidity exposure. If the integrity of the building envelope is less than ideal, one may need to account for non-conditioned high humidity air coming into contact with chilled water systems. Another risk factor is whether or not a given building will be subject to what's referred to as idle building syndrome. So if a commercial building is designed to be unoccupied at times, they may choose to shut down the air handlers for the HVAC system. However, the chillers and the chilled water pipes are often required to remain operational. This combination of an unconditioned space, high humidity ambient air, along with the same chilled pipe surfaces can create a prime environment for condensation to occur. In any scenario, you're gonna to wanna to consider your specific environment and always design for worst case conditions for your system. Similar to indoor environments, outdoor chilled water systems may be subject to additional risk factors that need to be considered. It's gonna be important to ensure that any materials exposed to direct sunlight have adequate UV resistance. Seasonal extremes in temperature and humidity will also need to be determined and taken into consideration. And then if an, in a location where the system can be exposed to various chemicals or fuel, resistance to these materials may prove critical. Other important questions you might want to ask yourself is, will your insulation material withstand burrowing activities from vermin? On direct buried systems, are your materials going to withstand the compression load of soil backfill? If in high traffic areas, will materials withstand mechanical damage from pedestrian traffic or simply just from the weather? Once again, the worst case conditions for your specific system should be determined and designed around. And then we have jacket emissivity. So emissivity is a relative effectiveness of a surface to emit and absorb heat by radiation. It is expressed as a ratio between zero and one 
and is most relevant to the outermost jacketing to be used on an insulation system. The higher the emissivity, the more heat transfer that will occur between the material and its environment via radiation. When considering chilled water pipes in warm environments, low emissivity jacketing materials, such as aluminum and steel, will absorb less heat from their surroundings via radiation. This will then result in a lower jacket surface temperature. The opposite can be said for high emissivity jacketing materials, such as PVC and ASJ, which are going to absorb more heat from their surroundings, creating an overall higher surface temperature for that same system. Here's an example of jacket emissivity for you guys. So we can see exactly how this effect comes into play in our design considerations. In this example, we have two eight inch chilled water pipes operating at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, each insulated with an unknown type X insulation. There's no wind and the ambient air is 90 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of 80% which is gonna give us a dew point of 83 degrees Fahrenheit. When covering our insulation with brand new aluminum jacketing, the surface temperature we get is 81.9 degrees Fahrenheit. This is less than the dew point of the surrounding air and becomes an immediate concern for surface condensation on the jacketing to take place. However, when we take the same system and we cover it with a PVC jacketing, more heat from the environment is allowed to transfer onto the jacket surface, giving us a surface temperature of 86.7 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's going to be safely above the dew point where surface condensation would be an issue. So as we have now learned, there are multiple factors that go into designing a successful insulation system for your chilled water applications. As a recap, when designing your system, you'll always want to determine the worst case condition of your environment and plan accordingly. This includes the max temperature and relative humidity to be expected, as well as any indoor or outdoor complications that may be applicable. You'll want to make sure to calculate the thicknesses necessary to prevent surface condensation, taking into account the emissivity of the jacketing that is going to be used. Finally, make sure to leave adequate spacing between and around pipes for the insulation to be installed properly. When selecting an insulation material for a high-risk environment, consider a material that is closed cell and non-absorbent with a low to zero perm rating. It should be durable enough to tolerate its environment and have a compressive strength to withstand any weight that will come to rest against it, especially in direct buried and pipe support applications. And then finally, proper installation and inspection should be carried out during construction to ensure the system is properly installed and sealed against moisture intrusion. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic on over to Alec. Thank you very much, Kenzie, uh, for that important information. So uh, Kenzie talked a lot about uh, common things to keep in mind in terms of the science and methodology behind uh, insulating chilled water lines. Uh, I'd like to take some time now to jump into additional considerations that should be made if your chilled water line happens to be an underground system. So one example of a potential underground system is the fact that these chilled water lines can often be direct buried, uh, whether that be traveling between or underneath uh, commercial buildings. Uh, one immediate challenge that direct buried systems face involves the forces of different loads that the piping and the insulation will be subject to. Uh, first, we have the soil load, which refers to the direct weight exerted on the pipe from all that soil being backfilled on top of it. This will increase with soil density as well as with burial depth. Um, next, we have the live load, which refers to the weight transferred to the pipe from any heavy or moving objects from above the ground surface. This could be in the form of a stationary load, such as a building, or a dynamic load, such as vehicles on a roadway. Uh, the live load will be greater as the weight and movement of any objects increases above. Uh, when pipes have larger outer diameters, it will also increase, and it will also be the highest in areas of shallow burial depth. In either case, the combined load of the 
piping and insulation system will be subject to, should be considered, and an insulation material with sufficient compressive strength to withstand these loads should be specified accordingly. Hydrostatic pressure within the ground soil should also be considered on these direct buried systems. Uh, hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted by a fluid at equilibrium at a given point within the fluid due to the force of gravity. Uh, this is a big factor in high water table locations and areas that experience high levels of precipitation throughout the seasons. Hydrostatic pressure increases as the soil depth increases, uh, and this pressure can drive water into insulation systems through any gaps or breaches of the system's moisture barrier, uh, especially common at joints and protrusions. In the case of absorbent insulations, uh, this moisture can then seep in and saturate the insulation material, compromising thermal performance and leading to the previous aforementioned issues. In these areas, a closed cell and non-absorbent insulation uh, should be considered in order to mitigate the risk of insulation failure due to moisture ingress into the system. One thing to keep in mind is the fact that soil itself is not an efficient insulator. Uh, on direct buried systems, if the insulation were to fail or no insulation is used, uh, energy efficiency will be compromised and heat will be able to freely travel to and from the piping system and its surroundings. Piping from one process often intersects or runs parallel to another process lines in these types of buried systems. Uh, that takes place within soil. If a high temperature steam line were to be uninsulated or have a compromised insulation system, heat would be able to transfer to any adjacent lines. And if that adjacent line happens to be carrying chilled water, the escaping heat from the steam could raise the temperature and negatively impact the performance of the HVAC system due to the chilled water line. In more severe instances, this heat could even be significant enough to damage or melt neighboring PVC lines as well as the casing of electrical wiring, uh, damage that could very well lead to excavation for repair. Unplanned maintenance on direct buried lines can become quite costly, especially after the job is completed. Uh, and this all just further emphasizes the importance of proper insulation selection, design, and installation beforehand. Uh, in other instances, Chilled water and steam lines could share a space underground in tunnels or trenches. In these scenarios, if the ambient air within a tunnel were to be dramatically raised due to insulation failure on an adjacent steam line, this will increase vapor drive from the warm ambient air into and onto the chilled water line itself. Uh, in the case of permeable insulations, any compromise of the system's vapor barrier will allow for water vapor to freely condense onto the chilled water pipe surface underneath and within the insulation. And this is another potential cause for failure of a system's insulation, resulting in all the issues mentioned before. Uh, another challenge with underground tunnels involves the risk for flooding to occur. It is quite common for tunnels to experience flooding at some point within their lifespan. Uh, if flooding does occur, your insulation system could be subject to being submerged in water for periods at a time. Uh, in this case, if a permeable or absorbent insulation material is used, water could possibly penetrate the system through any openings in the vapor barrier, uh, saturating the insulation and compromising thermal resistance. Some pump systems can help to mitigate this risk, but they themselves are subject to clogging and failure. Uh, to combat this, uh, again, a non-absorbing insulation may be preferred as they will resist absorbing water even in the event of a flood. It's equally important to use proper insulation accessories in these examples to ensure the integrity of all joints and penetrations of the insulation system. Finally, the size of these tunnels containing these hot and cold process lines will vary depending on the scale of the overall HVAC system. They range from large enough for multiple people to walk through to small enough to be a simple crawl space. In either way, maintenance involving workers may take place within them at some point. An insulation system with adequate compressive strength can better withstand damage from foot traffic and any impacts associated with maintenance workers. Additionally, depending on the tunnel's location and access, po access points, uh, there is potential for vermin to find their way in. 
Uh, a durable and inorganic insulation in particular will deter the burrowing activities uh, and prevent itself from acting as a food source. And now with all of this taken into consideration, I'd like to bring up one solution in particular that may be considered for these types of systems, and that is cellular glass insulation, a zero permeability approach. So just what is cellular glass insulation? For those that may not be familiar, cellular glass insulation is a lightweight, rigid material composed of millions of completely sealed glass cells. It boasts a wide surface temperature range from minus 450 all the way to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and its closed cell structure and inorganic nature lend to some unique properties amongst insulation materials within the industry. Foam glass cellular glass insulation is completely impermeable with a water vapor permeability rating of zero. It does not require the use of a separate external vapor barrier to achieve this, as the insulation itself acts as its own vapor barrier. It also boasts a relatively high compressive strength when compared to other insulation materials in the industry, making it commonly suitable and specified for direct buried and pipe support applications. It's also very dimensionally stable, having a thermal expansion coefficient similar to that of carbon steel, making it suitable for wide temperature cycling applications as well. Being 100% uh, or inorganic and made of glass, foam glass itself is non-combustible and does not give off dangerous gases in the event of a fire, making it suitable for fire protection and fire stop applications. It also is resistant to the nesting activities of common vermin that may be found in an area and is chemically resistant in a similar fashion to many common glass beakers you may expect chemicals to be held in. Finally, it is easy to cut and fabricate and can be prefabricated to many different shapes and configurations prior to delivery on a job site. And finally, I would like to wrap things up just by talking about some technical services that we as a business offer those in the industry looking to use our insulation systems. We maintain over 125 different commercial and industrial uh, insulation system guide specifications. Uh, these are commonly used as a guide uh, by engineers, specifiers, contractors, and facility owners to aid in the design, installation, and maintenance activities around these insulation systems. They include various products in the systems themselves, detailed drawings, and installation guidelines, and we'd be happy to take a look at your own specification to help provide any advice that you may be looking for. Here's an example of one of our detail drawings that we offer uh, specific to our chilled water system. Uh, we generate drawings like these regularly to help bridge the gap between specification and field installation <clears throat> and to increase the confidence level that at the end of the day, proper application techniques are being utilized on site. Additionally, we maintain and utilize a full suite of proprietary thermal calculation softwares to help aid in the design for those who do specify our insulation systems. If you have questions as to what insulation thickness or jacketing material to use in order to achieve a certain surface temperature, uh, if you're curious about cost savings potential, or if you have general questions about process control in general, we'd be happy to assist with a tailored thermal calculation support for your specific system. We also provide on-site support around process improvement and energy savings. We have multiple certified thermographers on staff, including myself. Uh, we can arrive on your job site or facility to perform an infrared inspection survey and conduct heat flow measurements and analysis. We can then issue a current insulation condition report where we evaluate energy losses and savings potential and provide general advice on insulation system improvements to consider for your facility. And finally, we are seen as an industry leader in education, training, and startup support. We hold frequent training sessions that allow us to build relationships with customers through shared experiences. And these types of events allow engineers and specifiers to become more familiar with our systems and allows contractors to better understand how to effectively install them in order to achieve the best performing system possible. Uh, here you can see 
uh, one of our global training centers located in Houston, Texas, where we frequently host training opportunities like these. And we have pre-generated uh, curriculum on a variety of types of specific systems that you may be interested in insulating, such as cold and cryogenic systems, hot systems, and chilled water systems like we talked about here today. Uh, if you are interested in any of these types of training opportunities for you or your team, please reach out to us on, with any interest on how we can collaborate with you. And with that being said, I'd like to take the time to uh, thank everyone for joining us here today. Uh, myself and Kenzie's email addresses can be seen listed there, uh, as well as the phone number and email for our technical services and training team. Please feel free to reach out to us with any questions or follow-ups you may have. We'd be happy to work with you. And with that being said, I believe I will pass it back over to Jared. Thank you all so much, uh, Alec and Kenzie. Appreciate it. This was a uh, great information. Um, I do. I'd like to add just a couple of things. Um, you mentioned the custom fabrication, and I think most people on this webinar know, but um, um, Distribution International has absolutely phenomenal fabrication facilities and fabrication teams, and they um, really, really thrive on um, doing some some really neat customizable things to fit your project, and they they take pride in making sure that every cut is is clean and that the uh, the end fabricated product is um, is is of the highest quality. So um, keep that in mind as well. I also wanted to uh, I, I've been to that training facility uh, here in Houston, and it is it is outstanding. It's phenomenal. Uh, we've used it for a couple things, um, and so um, uh, I just wanted to echo that as well. While we are waiting for questions, well, first I want to remind people, if you have a question, submit it through the questions tab on uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and while we're waiting, I do just want to also take a second to um, remind everybody to, to visit distributioninternational.com. It's more than just a website. It's a robust digital customer platform. It has a wide range of value-added features. You can, when you register on the site, you can view past invoices, request quotes, and even submit orders online if you choose to. I think probably the best feature is uh, a detailed product catalog of more than 30,000 products. It's easy to search, it's easy to navigate, and has tons of information about each product. So go to distributioninternational.com today and uh, register for your online account. <clears throat> All right, we do have a question here. It says, how can I determine what the surface temperature of, uh, what surface temperature my insulation jacketing will be? Yes, I'll take that, Jared. Uh, good question. Um, that goes back to one of these slides Kenzie was talking about on the influence of jacket emissivity uh, based on your environment. So there's a lot of parameters to consider, uh, and there's no one right answer without taking a look at what your specific uh, system looks like, what your process temperature is, what your insulation thickness is, and what your ambient conditions are. Um, so that'd be something where we'd be happy to work with you specifically and use one of our uh, varieties of software tools where we can input your various parameters. That'd be uh, ambient air temperature, relative humidity, uh, process temperature, and insulation thickness. Um, and we can play around with different types of emissivities of jacketings and give you an idea as to what changing the jacketing material type might do for your surface temperature. Uh, again, it, there are instances where using a higher emissivity jacketing like PVC or ASJ might yield a high enough uh, surface temperature to avoid surface condensation, where using a metallic or hot low emissivity jacketing would struggle to do so. Um, so it's very specific to your system in general, feel free to reach out and we can be happy to work with you whenever you have a system in question. Great, thanks. We um, we do not have any other questions. Um, so Alec and Kinsey, is there anything else that uh, you guys would like to add? I don't believe so, I think we're good, Kenzie? Yeah, I think we're good. Awesome, well thank you all again so much, appreciate your time. Um, for those on the call, um, we, we did record the webinar and we will post it on our um, the Distribution International uh, YouTube channel and, um, and on our website. So if you go to distributioninternational.com under resources, you'll see a, a link for the DI 101 webinar series and you can go there and view uh, past webinars that we've done. So we'll, we will post it there 
uh, this one there in the next couple of days. So with that, I want to thank everybody and uh, for joining, and um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jared. Thank you.